<laughs> I'm really pleased to be here. It's such an exciting thing, and it's great to have the opportunity to address a, a public audience, uh, different, older and more seasoned and wiser than some of my own undergraduates. <laughs> um, I love my undergraduates. Rutgers is a public university. People don't always know that. Um, it's one of the oldest universities in the country. It has a pre a pre-colonial foundation. I think it's 1766. So there's a real specialness to the university and to the publicness of it. And as you'll see, that's a part of my talk today. I hope by the end of this talk, you have a very different understanding of what corporations are. And some of you may begin to intuit as the talk goes along um, where I'm headed and why I began with this example of Rutgers. I've just finished a book, as Patrick has said, uh, and you know how it is in academia. We write these books for an extremely long time, and then finally they come out. And in the end, when they're finished, you kind of stand back and you look at what you've written and you think, does this make sense? Do, do I mean this? Do I, do I believe this? And uh, one of the reasons that I like to work on the history of science is that I really believe in the idea of hypothesis. I really believe in the idea that you can, in a sense, blow a kind of a bubble of argument and float it out uh, to other people. So I'm very much someone who believes in dialogue. And that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to road test an idea. I'm going to give you a, a synopsis of what some of my arguments and thinking has been. And then we're going to have a QA. and a uh, And I'm, I'm really, really curious to hear what you have to say. There is a kind of experimental empirical quality to this exercise. Um, and also, as you'll see in the talk, it's really very much going to be an exercise. And the talk is very much about the themes of the Chicago uh, Humanities Festival what it means to come together, why you like to come together and have a live event, why you like to come and speak to other people face to face. If we could do this regularly in an instituted way, collectively, we would have a new understanding of what corporations are. And that's what my talk is about. Well, let me say a couple of quick things about what you're seeing here. Uh, these are a series of images that I've taken from a really interesting web, uh, website. It's a blog. It's called Geometry Daily. It's published, I suppose is the word we use, by a German uh, designer. And he puts up geometrical images every day. He has a different image. And the reasons these, this is here for, for two different reasons. In the first place, it's here because in my experience, when you're sitting in a talk, it can be a little fatiguing to listen to someone's voice going on and on. And having a, an, a visual image that you can focus your eyes on and, in a sense, distract your eye allows your ears and your mind to open. And the abstraction of the image, I think you'll find, actually facilitates your apprehension of the talk. And it is also here because so it has this, this, this purpose. It also is meant to illustrate a, an idea that's lingering in the idea of corporations, which is really the idea of parts and wholes. How do we get a whole thing out of parts of things? How do individual citizens come to constitute something we might call a community, a body that's bigger than any one of them individually? I realize I'm leaning over the microphone. This is not working. I'm using this. I can stand back. It's much more comfortable. Um, so all of these images, originally I was planning to walk around you know, like this, but the problem is I get blinded. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll restrict my movements to this area, this quadrant right here. As long as I don't step over that line, I'll still be able to see. Uh, all of the images that you see here are illustrations, you know, graphic, formal illustrations without content. They're simply formal. Illustrations of possible relationships between parts and wholes. And since that is ultimately, if you want to abstract kind of as far as possible, that is the, the ultimate sort of philosophical problem of the corporation in my view. Uh, of which the law is just one narrow slice of that problem. How do we get parts from holes out of parts? How do holes become parts again? So that's the problem of, of what they call dissensus, or people breaking up, people um, protesting, people disaffiliating themselves. That's a very important problem. And then, of course, sometimes when that happens, uh, the parts that used to be part of a whole become parts, and then they form a new whole again. And that's what you get when you have uh, the formation of a new church or any new kind of organizational group. So all of these images are giving us examples of parts turning into holes and holes into parts. And it's like those old psychological experiments with the, with the duck chicken or whatever. You know, you look with one eye, you see the duck. You look with the other eye, you see the chicken. Do you see a part or do you see a hole? 
And if your mind is kind of being exercised in that bifocal way, I think that'll be an interesting thing. Let me make one last preliminary uh, statement before we turn to our exercise, which is why you have those cards. Uh, we've, we've been set up to talk about Citizens United by the caption of my talk. And we can talk about that if you'd like to at the end. Um, <laughs> you're all sinking, thinking to yourselves, yes, please, throw me the red meat. Um, actually, my talk is about everything that, or a lot of things that I think Citizens United leaves out. So the premise, if you like, of my talk is that a legal definition of corporations is much, much too narrow, that we are forgetting to some extent, which is not to take anything away from the incredible importance of that case and the incredible importance of the decision in the case and, and the things that, the corruption that the case is trying to address. But it is, you should remember, a case that is actually being argued on fairly narrow grounds. It's being argued on the, a lot of it has to do with technical issues about uh, the court's own precedent and, uh, and, and the very specific issue of corporate speech in uh, the context of an election. Now, those are vital, vital issues, but they are narrowing our conversation about corporations today. And they're narrowing our sense, and they're, in a sense, they're, impa they're inflaming our passions in ways that I don't think are helpful. So the, the purpose of the talk is to give you a little bit of, I'll just be, say, a philosophical and historical context for the problem of what a corporation is with the aim of reframing for you a little bit all of the issues that could come up in that, in that case but don't and all the other things that we, we would want to consider when we think about corporations. So what I'd like to do to begin is to engage in a little bit of a thought experiment. You should have a note card and a pencil, which I asked the ushers to, 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 to distribute it. Thanks to, to them for doing that. And I'd like each of you to take just like a minute or two, really not very much. But I would like you to use this moment to become reflective. I'd like you to use this moment to become reflective. And I want you to take this card and I want you to write down as many different groups that you belong to currently in your life today or in the course of your life up until now. Any group, but I want you to focus on the ones that have been most important to you. So what are the most important groups that you have been a member of in your life that have been most important to you, that have contributed something to your life as a person, to your, to your worldview, um, to your sense of purpose, any of those things, write those down. And you can write down any kind of group that you want because for the next 10 minutes, we're gonna narrow down some possible choices that you might have made. And we're gonna talk about what characterizes some kind of groups rather than other kind of groups. And we're gonna dial in to the kind of group that I wanna talk about today. So take a few minutes and reflect on your life, your biography as written from the point of view of your group biography, not your individual biography. We think about our history as, as a linear unfolding of our own self-development as people, emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, physically. All of us have biographical events that are significant to us. What I want you to think about is not think about yourself as an individual person. I want you to think about yourself as a group person, as a member of a group. And obviously, you write them on your card. And at the end, you'll have one of two options. You can keep your card as a memento, if you feel like it's been something significant happened to you. You can take notes on this card, of course. You didn't think you were going back to class today, but you were, you're coming back to class. You can take notes on the card. You can take them home. Or, if you like, you can give them to me. And they'll become part of a little archive of material that I'll have to refer to the different groups that, that people affiliated themselves with. And of course, it can also become uh, an occasion for our own conversation afterward. So if, has everybody written down a, a few things, maybe? Maybe at least one. If you're someone who's having trouble, that's OK, too. If you can't think of a group, that's no problem. Uh, leave it blank. And definitely come up afterward and talk to me. 
because I want to hear from you. Uh, if you are the kind of person who is constitutionally not part of a group, it's either because you're missing something that you are part of, or you really, you're an unusual person. Aristotle said that uh, to be a human person was to be someone who lived in a political life with others. And there were only two kinds of beings that were not capable of living in group life. And the first was what he, he called animals. He said animals don't live in, they're not capable of having political life. Now, of course, we know now that animals form packs and groups in very deliberate ways, but for Aristotle's purposes and in, in, in his political definitions, uh, animals, and the other were gods. Gods also do not need friendships. Because for Aristotle, to form a polis, to form a political community, was to form a friendship. And democracy for him was the most important form of political community because it was the form in which people experienced friendship as the axiom, in a sense, or the, 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 the connecting point and the, the affective connection to political community is forming friendship. But you can't be friends with animals, he said, and you can't be friends with gods. There's actually a lot of people who have contested the animals part of it because, um, of course, many of us are friends with animals. Um, I, I traveled to Turkey not too long ago, and one of the things that surprised me and no one ever told me, I'm a huge cat person. I love cats. And the cats were everywhere in Turkey. I don't know if you've been to Istanbul, but there are feral cats all over the streets. And I was actually there. This is a little parenthesis. This is how I lecture, incidentally, with my students, and some of them love it, and some of them can't stand it. They was like, why doesn't he keep going and stay with the point? But anyway, I was in Istanbul, and the cats were everywhere, and for me, as a cat person, I couldn't resist it. You know, I was trying to touch them, and they were dancing out of my way, you know, and like not really letting me. And I had to give a presentation about animals and citizenship, actually, at that, at, while I was there. And I came up with the idea that the, the, that the cats in Turkey kind of emblematize citizenship. They are present public members of the community. They affect policy, they're there, they're part of your everyday life, and yet you can't own them, you can't touch them. They're actually alien and other to you. And there was something very powerful about that idea to me, and I think, uh, I think Aristotle, even Aristotle, would have conceded that. Of course, it's correlated with a terrible um, treatment of dogs in Turkey. There's a very famous episode, almost basically, of genocide of dogs, where they exported all the dogs to an island because, uh, well, in any case. So you've got your, your, your groups written down. Well, let's start narrowing these groups down a little bit. Now, I'm going to start with the broadest and maybe a kind of counterintuitive notion of the group, and maybe some of you did not think of this group. I suspect many of you did not, but I would like to exclude these things to begin with anyway. One of you, the questions you may have for yourself is, what do I mean by a group? You know, if you ride the bus to work every day, or you take the L to work every day, you like to shop at a certain grocery store, is this a group? You like to go to the public library, is this the kind of group I have in mind? It's not. I don't mean these kinds of groups. For the exercise that we're conducting, everyone who takes the bus at a certain time of day, or everyone who's in the L at a certain time of day, or even everyone who's sitting in this room right now, is forming a group in some sociological definition of the word. But that's not what we're talking about today because these groups are not voluntary groups. Now, it is voluntary that you came to this event. That's true. But the fact that you came is, also has an accidental quality to it. And that's certainly true of all the people who ride the bus to work every day uh, on, on the same bus. Obviously, there are patterns where people live and so forth. But they don't go to join a group they go to ride the bus. And I would say that the same maybe is even true here today. It's certainly true of shopping at a store. So if you go to a store, you might choose to shop at one store rather than another, but you don't have a strong preference. You're not motivated by the store, really. You might find some place more pleasant than another, but you're not going to shop for the store. You're going because you want to buy the things that are at the store. You're not going to spend time at the store. And that's because stores don't address us as groups. They address us as individuals. They actually don't want us to identify as groups. Now, if you have a store that you go to, and you go there because, not just because they sell things to you that you like, but because you actually kind of like hanging out at the store, and you like the people that you meet there, and you like the conversation, and you feel like their ideas are interesting, that counts as the kind of group I have in mind, because that place has stopped being a store. It's become something else. It's become a community. The co-op is the perfect example of this. Some of you are probably members of co-ops. A co-op is always more than a place than just to buy food. It's a place where you, uh, it's a form of collective enterprise. And it's motivated by a common purpose of forming a special kind of community. 
and you do pledge a commitment to a co-op. That's different from, say, riding the bus or just going grocery shopping. You join affirmatively. You become a member. You have a card. And the sign of this affirmative choice in most co-ops, traditionally, is a very visceral and obvious sign of membership. You work there. You don't just pay money. And now, these days, you can pay money. But ultimately, originally, you would, you would work at a co-op. Now, this lets me point out a kind of inverse idea, because a grocery store, a commercial grocery store like Whole Foods is a very good example, which really wants you to think about yourself as a member of, communi of a community when you go to Whole Foods. They trade in this idea. And it can become this kind of voluntary, purposeful group for the people who work in the store. Sometimes those people form a union. And Whole Foods is not, doesn't like this idea. Uh, the union depends uh, you know, on the idea of a store and on the idea of being in the store, and it transforms the, the store into the kind of group I'm talking about. It's really a voluntary thing. It's an association made up of workers, concerned about the conditions, concerned about uh, acting collectively. So I want to now, if you look at your cards, I want you to kind of think about, are the groups that you have on there, would you call them voluntary groups or would you call them accidental groups? So if they're voluntary groups, you know, circle those. And if you feel like they're more accidental groups, don't uh, cross them out, but maybe put a parenthesis around them if they're accidental groups. Now, I'm going to use this distinction between an accidental group and a voluntary group to rule out another kind of group that may appear on some of your cards, and it's a very important one, and that group is your family. Many of you, okay, look at how many of you thought of your family, and of course I think of it too as my first. But for the purposes of this exercise, I want you to put brackets or parentheses around your family. Because it is a really important family group, but it is not what I would call a voluntary group. I mean, Thanksgiving's coming up, right? And, and we all know that uh, you're born into your family, and your relatives are your relatives, uh, like it or not. And of course, there are things that we do all the time that are affirmative for our families. And when we form, and I'm talking mostly about our families of origin, when we form new families, we do undertake, uh, you know, a voluntary act. And, you know, um, queer families, alternative families of all kinds, families that adopt children into them. These are very powerful forms of group. They're, they're groups that could be construed as voluntary groups. So there's no question that, that we would want to consider that. Um, you know, they're formed even with a conscious political purpose. But I'm going to set it aside because I think the family is more accidental than voluntary, but I'm going to set it aside for another reason. I want to introduce another distinction for our groups. It's private. It's a private group. It's not a public group. Not anybody can join your family at some level. And this is essential to its definition. It would not be a family if it were open to the public. It would be something else. And this is something that, that Aristotle understood when he defined the political community. He said political communities are formed, they originate in families. First we have families, and then we have aggregates of families, and then super aggregates of families, and then eventually we get something we call the state or the polis. But the state or the polis is not a family. They're not the same thing. If everyone was related homogeneously in that family type of relation, it would become some giant clan. It would not be something that he called a political community. So if you have families that are open to the public and that are uh, voluntary in that sense, you really have something else. You have a kibbutz, another kind of cooperative of some kind. It's different. So let's rule the family out. And this distinction from Aristotle is important because it really helps us define what a public group is in contrast to the private group. The public group, which is what I want you to focus on today, is a group that is open potentially to people that you do not know. It has people in it potentially or actually that you do not know, that you definitely don't know. And that is a really good definition of any public thing. This is a public occasion because we do not know all each other. There are many of you, you know, I don't know your names, I don't know anything about you. So we've narrowed this down a little bit. We're not talking about accidental groups, we're not talking about private groups. Look at your list again. Now I asked you to think about groups that you belong to, and some of you might be wondering, the caption that came up on the screen, what does it mean to belong? You can say, I think of groups I come in contact with, 
I brush up against, is that enough? Groups knock on my door, they call me on the phone, they ask me for money, the political parties, they want my money, they want my vote. Companies try to sell me things, they're groups. What about bigger groups? I live in Chicago, I live in a neighborhood, I'm a citizen of Illinois, I'm a citizen of the United States. Most of you, many of you, maybe not all of you. Hopefully not all of you. Hopefully there are non-citizens here too. So these groups, I think that's great. Let's, we can keep those big groups on the list. Some of these are irrelevant. They're out there, they give a basic structure to our society. We'll talk about them, but a lot of them are also kind of accidental groups. If you're a member of the group that we think of as Chicago or United States or the state of Illinois, there's an accidental quality to that. You were born into those groups. If these groups acquire a voluntary uh, quality for you, if you're someone who served in the military or you feel that you, you feel a purposeful, committed, citizen-like action uh, of participation and membership in the group, then definitely keep that on your list because that's, that's very important. So now we're getting to the heart of what I want to talk about today. Hopefully some of you have still on your lists groups that you belong to in an affirmative way and you participate th in them in an active, bodily, physical way. You, you join the group. You also emotionally, you feel affiliated to these groups. And you pursue interests that are important to you through these groups, and you pursue them only, th there are things that the group allows you to do that you cannot do on your own. So look at your list and ask yourself, are the groups that are on my list, are they things I voluntarily affiliate with? Are they things that I pursue activities through? Are they things that I feel connected to, you know, emotionally, that I feel like I really belong? I would unambiguously say that I belong. So these are really important. And we could say the United States, we could say these big groups, but they're smaller groups usually. So let's say, for instance, your church. People might have put their church down on the list. You might have put your school down on the list. You might have put your children's school on the list. These are things that sometimes have an accidental quality, but most people get very involved in their school and in their children's school. It might be a team. Some of you have been members of teams. Teams tend to have a very strong group identity. They're based on the model of the military distantly. The military really tries to get you to think in a group, a group kind of mind. You might think of a musical group, an orchestra, a band, uh, a rock group of some kind. Other kinds of civic groups, of course, of all kinds. Environmental groups that you might belong to. Uh, neighborhood groups, neighborhood associations, condo associations. I have a colleague who told me one time recently that the condo board and the condo association is the most common form of de democratic participation in the United States today, <laughs> which is really fascinating to me. But it, it's a very interesting idea that that is where people experience face-to-face -face deliberative democracy. Keep that, keep that in mind. Your job. Your job is a really important point of affiliation. The question there is, what's your relationship to the group formed by your work? Are you working for someone else? Do you feel kind of alienated, as, as they say? Or do you feel like you're really working for yourself through the group? There's things that you are affirming. I would say, for instance, in my job as a member of the university, I am working kind of harmoniously both for the group and for myself, and that there's a really a beautiful kind of coincidence between those things. Now, of course, among the groups that you are affiliated with, we could add the groups that you give money to. So which do you feel more strongly connected to? The group that you participate in and that you work in and for or the group you give money to? It's an honest question. Anyone want to tell me? Sorry? Participating. Now, we can feel very strongly about the groups we give money to but we feel even more strongly about the groups that we volunteer to act for. So, let's think about this group. Let's focus for a second on the group that you feel most belonging to. What binds you to this group? Think about that for a second, maybe even write it down. What is it about the group that makes you feel like you are a member? If it's not giving money, All right, so let me conclude this exercise before we move on with a few observations. I think that you probably feel most committed, that you belong most to the groups that you participate in rather than the groups you give money to. Some of you have said that. Groups that just require money are too transactional. And that transactional relationship is too thin. 
and it's an ultimately unsatisfying form of community membership. Money is effective, money is, is necessary, but it is not an emotional or a, I would say, really even politically, ultimately as consequential as direct action in a group. I would say that the groups that you feel, I'm gonna guess that the groups you feel most connected to are groups that let you do things you could not do on your own. That there are certain activities that can only be pursued in a collective way. And you may be even found on some occasions, and I will be very curious to know if this is true, if on some occasions when you have participated in these groups, playing in an orchestra, being a member of a church, being a member of a school or a team, other groups that you work, you begin to speak and to act and to think as a member of the group, not as yourself. If you have ever played in an ensemble situation, you know what I'm talking about. You actually begin to lose sight of yourself. And this is, of course, has a very ideal, powerful ideological effect in something like an army. You bear the group. That's Thomas Hobbes' term. You wear the group almost like a coat. You wear the group like a mask. And you begin to speak on behalf of or as if the group itself is speaking. This is very, very powerful. You've given that group the personality that it has. And the word person, you may be interested to know, it originally comes from Latin, from a theatrical idea for mask. It was the persona. It was the thing you sounded through. That's what persona meant, to speak through the mask. And when the Roman rhetoricians and lawyers borrowed that work and they said they were it and they use it in a legal context and they say, I speak to the judge. Here I am speaking into the mic again. I speak to the judge. I speak to you through a mask. I am a person. I play the role of my adversary. I play the role of my client. It's a theatrical idea for Cicero and for others. And they take this idea from the idea of the theater. So already, the notion of a corporate person in law has this sort of interesting theatrical background. We'll talk more about that in a second. This is maybe the most important thing that, that I think is for you to think about. And it's going to sound very abstract and philosophical, but I do want you to try to focus on it. I would say that one of the reasons you like the groups or feel affiliated with the groups that you belong to is because they have made you self-conscious about their purposes and their system of value. You identify with the purpose of the group. It is clear. It has a reason. You subscribe to the reason, and you recognize the system of values that motivate the group. In this definition, we find the corporation. That is what a corporation is. In its most essential form, the corporation is a group of people formed to pursue a collective activity that can only be pursued in a collective way. It is a group of people that have a clearly defined purpose that guides their actions. These purposes are, at some level, ideals. They are abstractions, they hover above us, and they infuse us. We agree with them, we act in them, we form ourselves into a, a body of members that is larger than any one of us. And when you get that N plus one quality, when you get that surplus extra, if there are 10 of us in this room and we form a partnership, or 500 of us or 200 of us in this room and we form a partnership, we form 200. If we form a corporation, we form 201. There is a new entity there in front of us. It's something that endures beyond the sum of its parts. Individuals can die who are members of a corporation, and the corporation continues to live. Roman lawyers thought that everyone could die except for one person, and the corporation could still be distinguished from the individual who was remaining. People have added something to themselves, and it is the authentic groupness. Now, we've been thinking about this fairly abstractly. It's pretty philosophical, so let's look at it historically and see if this can give us some more clarity. Here we have a corporation breaking up into its parts. Corporations are very, very, very old institutions. Many of you probably don't know that. Uh, several years ago, uh, and I'll, I'll wait for the groans here, but Mitt Romney, we all remember him, right? During his political com campaign, he got in trouble, and he said, turned to someone off the cuff, and he said, corporations are people too, my friend thinking he was being clever, and everybody jumped on him. And the fact is that he was actually kind of guilty of only one thing. He was guilty of misspeaking. 
Because if he had said corporations are not people, but corporations are persons, he would have been saying something that's just a legal truism. Because corporations have been persons as long as they've, they've, they've existed. That is their essence. That is what they have been invented to be. They've been invented originally to be legal persons. You can find the legal recognition of a corporation, of a group, as a person, as early as the second century AD in the institutes of the Emperor Justinian, which is the first codification of Roman law. Well, actually, Gaius, who Justinian is building on. Most legal historians argue, though, that a distinctive notion of corporate legal personhood is really something that appears only as of the medieval period, as of the 13th century. Roman law, as we understand it today, recognized groups as having certain rights and capacities. It recognized that groups could hold property, but it didn't think of them as persons. It didn't assign a will to them. It didn't give them moral responsibility to groups. But medieval lawyers did do that. And for the first time, the medieval lawyers began to carve out the idea, an idea that sounds very modern to us, which is the idea of the corporation as a fictional person, something that's imagined by the lawyer and made up but something that's still real. So the lawyers, uh, the medieval lawyers, and by the end of my talk, I'll tell you what the example was that they were thinking of. And we'll get some other examples too, but the example they were thinking of is very interesting. Uh, they think of the fictional person of the corporation as invented and abstract, but it is real. It is precisely because the lawyer has made it up that the corporation can have actual consequences in the world and do actual things. Now, you're probably familiar with the idea of a legal person, and you think that the, idea, the legal person applies to yourself. You're a legal person, right? And it's because you're a biological person. But that's not necessary for the law to understand. The law doesn't necessarily imply the idea of biological personhood. Really, uh, in history, many, many, many things have been legal persons. Bridges have been legal persons. Hospitals have been legal persons. There's a big movement today to extend animal right, uh, personhood to animals. Some environmental activists want to extend legal personhood to trees as a way of bringing into the law and making possible certain forms of legislation. So there's a funny conclusion we can draw from this legal history, which is that corporate persons aren't a perversion of the legal person. They're actually the first legal person. The very idea of legal personhood was invented in the 13th century to talk about groups of natural persons and to give them a purpose and an identity that they didn't have just as a collection of individuals. Now, if we move forward from the 13th century and we get to the 1600, let's say the turn of the 17th century to Shakespeare. Now, you know uh, from the introduction that this is the period I work on. I, I am a Shakespearean. It's the period that I study. And in Shakespeare's period, by the time we get to this period, the law recognized many different kinds of corporations. Cities, towns, all corporate. They had certain rights to elect representatives to parliament. Today, the governing body, I don't know how many of you have recently been to London, but which you, when you arrive in London, it is technically the corporation of the city of London still today, and the Lord Mayor of London is like the CEO of that corporation. Parliament was understood to be a corporation. They thought it was like a giant body with a head and, and members, uh, members forming the body. The trade guilds, every guild was a corporation. Remember, trade guilds were originally not just commercial. They had a religious purpose that was very important. Parish churches at a small scale, those were corporations. Hospitals, as I said, monasteries were corporations. The monasteries had been dissolved in 1600 when Shakespeare was living. There were no monasteries anymore. But the legal rights that had been attached to these monastic properties passed to the properties as they existed today uh, in Shakespeare's period. His play company had a theater. You've probably heard of it. It was the theater called the Blackfriars. And they could open the Blackfriars Theater only because it occupied a former corporate monastic property. And as such, it had certain rights that exempted it from the legal jurisdiction of the city of London. Now, Blackfriars was also a very fashionable place to live, and a lot of members of the Crown government and other very wealthy members of uh, London society didn't want a new theater in their neighborhood making lots of noise and uh, attracting the wrong kind of people, and they objected, but there was nothing they could do about it because it was a former monastery. It had a kind of corporate status, and that gave them a freedom that they could exploit. In Shakespeare's period, the kingdom was a corporation. They called it a body politic. Sitting on the throne and wearing a crown was a very interesting and bizarre form of corporation. 
They called it the corporation soul, the corporation that had only one member, and it was the monarch. It was the king and, or the queen. And the king and the queen had two bodies, had the body politic that was in the crown and then the physical body that could die. Let's take the biggest and the oldest corporate form that exists today, the church. It still exists. It's probably the oldest and the most, the most original corporation. And when the medieval lawyers are trying to think about legal theories for corporate bodies, they're thinking primarily of the church. If you would like to think about the trinity, uh, the trinity as three persons in one, you could say that this theological idea was borrowed by lawyers, and in a sense, the trinity is the first corporate form, or one of the oldest corporate forms that we have. So the church is a giant corporation. It's very odd, but it has a lot of the characteristics of modern corporations today. If you think of a Monsanto or a Blackwater or a Nike or whatever, or a BP and all these commercial corporations that we, we, we really object to, and for good reason, the church has a lot of these qualities. The church extends across ge geography uh, you know, ex incredibly extensively. The, the church extends across time. It obeys a totally different kind of time. The saints are members of the church and the people who, uh, of the apocalypse and the resurrection at the end of time, they are also part of the church. So in Shakespeare's period, uh, all of these idea, the arguments by theologians about what the church was and how it could be a member, a, a, a group that extended across time, these were all corporate ideas for them. And the Reformation, as we know it in England, the Puritans, when they split with the English church and they come to the United States, or what would become the United States, they form a compact and they declare themselves to be a corporate group. And they're an example of one of these parts that splits off from the whole. And the Reformation in England at a certain point is, is argued about whether, what the relationship between these corporations are. After the American Revolution in Philadelphia, African American Baptist churches became one of the first public corporations in the United States. Uh, there's a historian at uh, the University of Pennsylvania named Sarah Berenger Gordon who's done some excellent work on African American Baptist churches. When these churches wanted to split, when these founders wanted to split with white members of white churches and they wanted to form their own church, they turned to provisions in Pennsylvania law that allowed them to form a church as a corporate body. And they were allowed to be chartered. And today, still, some of these churches are the oldest corporations in America. So we're getting a really different sense of how many corporations used to exist in this period. Now, as of about 1550, right? As Shakespeare's a small, not even born yet. We get the first appearance of the kind of corporation that we know today, the joint stock, for-profit, commercial corporation. And these are the ancestors of these corporate persons that loom so large over our own moment, but they are relative latecomers in this history, and they were created to for overseas trade, and the slave trade originates as a joint stock venture in Africa. They explore the Americas, they develop trade routes, everything they do is commercial. And they function by selling shares, and to be a member is to buy a share. Now, some of you may not know, it's very interesting, Shakespeare's play company was a joint stock company of this type. It was the most successful joint stock, one of the most successful joint stock companies of his period. He was more than a playwright, and he was more than a one-time actor. He was a shareholder. He was part of a small group of eight people who owned shares collectively in all the profits of the company and in the theater themselves itself. And they that difference, the fact that they owned the theater, was, uh, was what made them so successful. There were other actors who did not own shares, who were what we call hired men, and at a certain point they bring a lawsuit to try to get access to the shares in the company because they feel that their labor, that's the word that they use, is being uh, not adequately compensated. Now, Shakespeare's theater company is interesting for another reason because it has all these characteristics of a corporation, but it never actually legally incorporated. And this leads me to an important point I wanna make about corporations, because for all the legal history I'm giving you, I don't think we are gonna understand corporations as group persons. We are not gonna understand your own biography as a group person if we restrict the idea of a corporation to a legal idea. When I asked you to think about the groups that you belong to, and I said to you, why do you feel like a member of this group? I do not think that you thought about its legal status. You did not think about its charter. You thought about other things, ideas and actions that you take. What gives a corporation a personality? What makes it a real thing? 
we can't let the law tell us that only the law is what gives a corporation life. If you think about a corporation like Nike, it doesn't exist as a corporation with power today because it's incorporated in Oregon. It has this power because of its logo. And you wear the logo, maybe some of you, and you endow that logo with your own experiences. And the corporation of Nike has an almost vampiristic relationship to your personality. It gets its personality from you and from your participation in it. Now, if you compare this form of participation in a group wearing a logo with something much more profound, whatever your religious beliefs, to be a member of the church in the medieval period, or still today to be a member of the Catholic Church, requires an act of communion. It's a mystical idea of participation in which Christ's body and blood become actualized in a, in a piece of bread and in wine. And in this literal incorporation of this, of this object into your body, you become a member of the church. This is totally different from wearing a logo or wearing a brand. I would say it's a much, much more meaningful form of participation. Now, I'll be candid and I'll say I'm not a religious person. But I think, I often wonder that, I think our political lives would be better if we had secular equivalents to this process, where we become almost like devotional members of groups that we belong to, and we think about them actively, and I don't just mean saying the Pledge of Allegiance in classrooms every morning, that's not what I have in mind. I would like to see more organizations flourish of the kind that we've identified in our experiment together, bodies that facilitate collective action, that make manifest a shared set of purposes and ideas, and it's shared systems of value that we can act together with. Now, I think that we're going to have a much richer account of our political life if we think about this definition of corporations as one that we could use affirmatively. I think that our political our notion of ourselves as political creatures, with all due respect to our topic this year at the Chicago Humanities Festival, I think if we think of ourselves only as citizens in relationship to an anonymous public, and in relationship to a super personal state that invites us to vote every four years or every two years, our notion of ourselves as politically active and politically enfranchised and ethically motivated people is going to become very, very thin. We need to understand that that is not how our political life is lived. It's not lived actually today. It's not lived out on an empty stage like the citizens in Shakespeare's play Coriolanus. I don't know if some of you know the play. Maybe you've seen the movie with Ray Fiennes where the citizens have been stripped of all their corporate associations and they're just a mob. And they face this military figure who wants to become a kind of dictator. That's what I, 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 I fear sometimes that our political life is headed maybe not in that direction, although we can see it happening in a place like Syria today. The decay of all kinds of civic organizations, meso-layer, mid-level associations that people belong to that mediate between the private individual and the family on the one side, the state on the other, in a place like Syria, all that's left is the army and everything is falling apart. So we need these, we need these groups. I think if we try to teach ourselves how we recognize the corporate forms that we belong to already, the ones that you are a part of. And if you start thinking about the expanded role that these groups could have in your life, I think we would have a much, much richer sense of what um, our political life could be together. And if we begin to act as these groups and belong to these groups, I think we'll feel like we're, we're having a more um, meaningful political participation as well. I think that also that we can understand certain problems in our contemporary world if we think about corporations in the way I'm describing them. So in healthcare, for instance, I'm really dismayed to see the dissolution of nonprofit healthcare cooperatives in the United States today. These are exactly the kind of corporate forms that I'm talking about, and they're being assaulted by Republican pro-business policies that just don't like the very idea of a nonprofit organization uh, one bit. But I think these, these cooperatives would be a vital new form of corporation that would improve all of our lives. I think economically, I'm going to be very candid and say, I think every single person in the United States would be economically better off if they became a member of a union. Uh, Rutgers faculty members are members of unions. We are unionized. And there is no question that that kind of group association gives heft and ballast and power 
and advocacy and volume when faced with the overwhelming kind of crushing logic of budget constraints and administrations. And that is true in every, uh, every workplace. And I'm happy to talk with others, with people about that if there are people who don't like unions. I, I obviously am someone who is committed to them and I think that they are a very important form of corporation. So maybe that's something also you can take away from this talk. When you hear the word corporation, you have to remember Citizens United is also permitting unions to spend money. So the union is a very important corporate form. I think public edu education, which is something I'm very committed to, would be greatly improved if people understood the corporate nature of a school, an elementary school, a high school, a university, a place where all people, all citizens, all non-citizens are elevated to become knowing persons with self-determination. I'm very active in the PTA in my daughter's school, for instance, and that, that is a very a good example of a corporate form. But let me close with this example of education because I think this is gonna surprise you, but the word in Roman law and the word in medieval law and even in Shakespeare's period, they had a word for corporation. And it was Latin. And that word, you might think, is corporatio. <laughs> or you might think it's corpus. Or you might think it's corporatus. Well, it's not those words. It has no relationship to the word corporation as we spell it and know it in English. The word they used for corporations was universitas. That's right. It's what our word university comes from. When we refer to the university, in a literal translation, a medieval lawyer, someone in Shakespeare's period would hear that and they would say, oh, you're a member of the corporation. And your corporation can do certain things and has certain rights and it has, what's the personality of your corporation? They also use the word college. That's what the word college comes from, a collegium was a corporate body. So I have been captivated by this idea. That is the corporate person I speak for and ask today is the university. The modern arguments about corporations that appear as early as the 13th century, these appeared around the formation of the University of Paris, the first modern university in the Western world. It was a body of teachers who wanted the authority to decide what they taught, to whom they taught it, who got to teach it, when they got to give degrees, for what measure they got to uh, grant those degrees, who got to govern them and rule themselves. They wanted professional authority. They wanted a kind of political authority. They were opposed by their bishop and their dean and their chancellor, and they appealed directly to the pope, and he recognized them as a corporate body. And the documents around this exchange and this, this conflict produced the first language of corporations. The university is the first corporation, not the church, I would argue. So I want to leave you with a hypothesis. You've heard the account of my corporations, uh, corporations as I've described them. Philosophically, you've thought about them in your own lives a little bit. You've heard an historical account. And if you accept, even provisionally, my definition of a corporation, you're going to see that today we suffer from a particular problem. And it's what I call a corporate monoculture. Just like the monoculture of corn that people are familiar with. We suffer from a corporate monoculture of the for-profit commercial corporation. It has squeezed all the air out of our dialogue, all the air out of our concepts when we think about what corporations are. It is what makes us uncomfortable with the idea of attaching the word corporation to a university in the good sense or a church or all these other ideas because we've, been, we've, been, we've grown up and in a sense programmed to a monoculture that that takes all of that collective purpose and that collective amplification and restricts it to the for-profit form. And it, we've accepted, in, uh, well, maybe not all of us have accepted, of course not all of us have, but we live in a world where this system of values that defines the commercial corporation has become the most important system of values in our politics, where money is a form of speech. And this transactional relationship of, of giving money has substituted for all these forms of communal active participation that are so important to the groups that are so meaningful to you. We've forgotten how many types of corporation used to exist. We've forgotten how many kinds of purposes those corporations served. We've forgotten how many systems of value used to motivate those corporations. So this is why I say that the problem of our political life is not that we have too many corporations in our politics. It's that we don't have enough corporations. We need more of them. You have sat here 
and listen to me long enough, what you need to do is go out and incorporate. <laughs> That's it. We have time for questions. I took a little yes. longer than I intended. Please raise your hand and don't speak until you get a microphone. It's got you right over there. Great. I may look familiar. Um, so a corporation is created for an economic reason. That, that, that which motivates it then is their economic success. What about, where, where then does the um, ideological or the um, interests of the individuals who own the corporation come through when it's strictly to be an economic uh, entity? Uh, is your question, how do you distinguish from the economic purpose of a corporation? Maybe I'm asking, where's, where does the good of being in a corporation come through when the whole interest is to be economically successful at the expense of all, of any other societal goods? I think there's very little good there, <laughs> myself. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that the idea of redefining the corporation would be to come up with a form of organization that was not narrowly uh, measured by profit and shareholder interest, uh, obviously. I'm sure I'm speaking for many people in the room when I say that. Um, however, you know, the Hobby Lobby case is very interesting because there's a case in which the Supreme Court is recognizing a version of what I'm talking about. It's saying, look, the corporate person isn't just commercially motivated. It actually has a conscience and its conscience allows it to make certain decisions about reproductive, uh, access to reproductive health care. And this you know, is a case that I'm still working on and thinking about because on the one hand, I think it's logically, there's a, there's a kind of impeccable logic to it. I really don't like the outcome. And I really don't like the idea that uh, what happens in these kind of corporate groups is that suddenly one small minority, in this case it's a family closely held corporation, which is allow them, what allows them to make that distinction as I understand it, speaks for everyone else in the corporation. And I would like to, I would like to think that thinking more broadly about corporations and, and, and beyond the legal sense that I've described, but rather really more philosophical way about what the systems of value are, how we deliberate about those systems of value, that the corporation, what I'm asking for is a kind of radical voluntarism a public form of voluntary action pursued in collective groups in which we deliberate about our systems of value, we act on our systems of value, and we do this. It's like an experiment in participatory democracy, and I think that these can be done without money at all. It's an interesting exercise to try to do that. This is actually our last question. If I may, let me take you back to uh, perhaps wrongly titled, but the title of the talk. And is there a difference in your view, between the personhood that was assigned to corporations in the Citizens United case versus what I'm going to refer to as perhaps a constitutional personhood, that is a person with the various voting rights as defined within our Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and our cultural political history? Yes, there is a difference for me. I think that there are differences between natural persons and artificial persons. There's no question about it. And I don't think that corporations should have the right to vote. Um, I, I think that you can object to many things about the Citizens United decision. You can object to the equation of money and speech. You can object to the um, corruption effects of the concentration of money through the corporate form. And you can still be interested in some of the philosophical problems that are raised by the idea of a corporation as a person as having an identity that resides in its purposes and it is larger than the group of, or different from, the group of people who make it up. That doesn't necessarily have to lead to the concentration of wealth and the expenditure on a single issue, for instance. It could lead to a massive kind of upheaval of collective action or, or a form of a public, a general strike, for instance, in the case of a union. So I think you need a notion of personhood from corporations to understand how a group like a union or other groups have a consequential form of acting in the world. But I don't think you necessarily have to understand them as equivalent to natural persons. Definitely, there's no question. We can be very interested in groups and how they differ from ourselves and how, how we somehow become something more than just our individual self when we're in a group without thinking that a corporate person is the same thing as a natural person. Obviously, that's not the case at all. 
any other questions? I, I took a little longer than I expected, so here we have a question over here. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. If uh, you have any more questions, you can please take them please into the hall with Henry.